Welcome to Conversations with Dr. Neva. I am your host, Dr. Neva, and today I have two fantastic, brilliant experts with me to talk about the topic on balancing family, career, and relationships. I, I feel that the work that I do it, with a parent-child also is about all of our relationships as well. Yes. So it's, a, it's about bringing a consciousness into every relationship in your life. And consciousness inevitably means looking within. So I need to be whole. Right. I can't look to the other to make me feel good That's about right. myself. It, each of us has to come to this with a sense of wholeness and sufficiency. And it takes, a, when I say consciousness, I mean a waking up. As, to ourselves. So I'd like to give tools. As I said, one of the biggest tools for a conscious parent is not reacting. I okay. feel that way in a relationship as well. Mm -hmm. Take that pause when you feel triggered and right. see how power, you, powerful it is not to react in instantly. So it's a very interesting exercise to do because initially you feel so entitled to react and yell and scream and we do mm -hmm. it to the ones we love the most, right. our partners and our children. We don't do it to our friends. We want to keep our friends and we know they can leave us. Mm. <laughs> so when your friend does something and spills the coffee on your very important report or something, you go, don't worry, we'll clean mm. it up. When your five-year-old does it, because he was playing with his friend screen. and running around <laughs> and knocks your coffee because he was, you know, in the, playing you know, Star Wars or something and he knocks over, you're, you're absolutely feel entitled to let loose right. on this child. That's very true. Right? Or if your husband did it, then certainly you'd oh, scream. Then you can right? no, no, Why of course. <laughs> but how about taking the same pause and the same care you mm -hmm. take? And I'm not saying to treat your children as though you, they are your friends. Mm -hmm. I'm saying treat them at least as, as well mm -hmm. as you treat your friends. Right. Treat your partner at least as well as you would treat your friend. So that, and, and I feel that, that not reacting, wait, and you'll see 15 right. minutes later when you didn't scream, that feels very, very empowering. empowering. Absolutely. It diffuses the whole situation. Right? It diffuses. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't make it better to scream, you know. The report is still has coffee on it, whether you screamed or not, you know. And the homework still wasn't done, mm -hmm. and the dog wasn't walked, whether you scream or not. You want solutions. The transformation, the solution to literally transform the relationship comes in not reacting. Absolutely. That's where we can be creative and Absolutely. there's space for change. Mm -hmm. So what happens in a household where one parent agrees to a, a uh, certain parenting style and the other doesn't? What happens? It's a great question. I get it all the time. Well, I say one conscious parent is better than none. Mm -hmm. Let's okay. start there. Mm -hmm. And each parent has a right to his or her own, own relationship with that child who they're co-parenting. So... You know, the problem when the parent comes to you and doesn't like the way the other one is doing something, you know, it gets a little bit tricky, but we are responsible for ourselves. We parent in our best way. And you can certainly talk to your spouse and try to teach and some parenting, conscious parenting techniques. And sometimes that spouse either cannot or isn't ready to learn this. Everyone awakens at their Different own pace times. Mm -hmm. and their own time. And I'm sure you find that. Right. No one in the, any relationship is in the same place. So we right. each come to the child with our own sense mm -hmm. of where we're at. And that child has invited these two parents and they are entitled to be where they are. Helen, we had a one-on-one -on -one conversation. You said there's two questions you always ask. What are those right. two questions? Right. I would said earlier, it's, it's, it's am I, do you hear me? Do you hear me? Do you see me? Yeah. Are you listening? And yes, in yes, hearing yes. and in seeing and in deeply listening, comes the answer to the second question, which is, am I worthy? If you took the time to listen and to hear me and to see me, I must be worthy. I must matter. And I think that that would go a long way, but you'll see in social situations that people don't even want to let each other speak. There's a lot of interrupting and there's, right. there's a lot of non-listening going on in this world <laughs> right now. People don't want to listen, right. and our children are screaming, don't tell me what to do, don't judge me, I have enough people giving me instructions, right. I have peers putting pressure on me, just hear me. Okay. That's so true, and one of the techniques too, and 
tell me because this is your expertise with my son growing up even especially as a teenager anytime something would happen I would say to him what could you have done to handle the situation differently instead of just judging him and saying mm -hmm. you were wrong you shouldn't have done that why right. did you do that but what could you have done differently right and and he will come to that on his own if he's not judged and shamed and blamed he mm -hmm. will come to other options and we, we also forget of course that our children's developmental age is based on where their brain is in that moment right. and we get so frustrated but a five-year-old brain and a 15-year-old brain they're not fully developed and we have to allow for the developmental stage of that child right also all right so we're going to take a break okay in a moment to, and when we come back we will speak with the studio audience lovely okay Welcome back to Conversations with Dr. Neva. <laughs> now we're going to take the time out to ask, the, have the studio audience ask you guys some questions. Okay. Hi, Dr. Neva. My name is Adrienne Garland, and I have a question for your panel of experts. Um, just with everything that you were talking about, it made me think about uh, some of the challenges that I've had with my two teenage sons, who are wonderful, by the way. Um, but they definitely, uh, I've gone through a lot with them. Um, sometimes they lie to me, um, even after repeatedly um, you know, asking them for the truth. And, and doing what you said, Ellen, to kind of take a step back, no reaction, I'm queen of, of no reaction, yet still, um, you know, they'll lie to me and I'll, I'll find out later on what the, what the true truth was. Mm -hmm. um, so do you have any advice on how to maybe get to the truth a little bit more quickly mm -hmm. so that we don't have to go through some of the the pain and, and all the strategies that I use to try and get them to tell me the truth. Well, I'm glad you see the wonder in them because I'm sure they're wonderful. Lying like anything else is a conditioned pattern. So Adrian, I suspect, because I see this all the time, that children lie because they're used to lying. But what's, what's beneath the lying is the fact that they didn't feel safe to tell the truth. Now that may have been earlier on, but we only lie because we can't tell the truth. If we can't tell the truth, we've learned that, you know what, we tell a lie, it's, there's gonna, no one's gonna be on our backs. So you need to really deconstruct the habit, the condition pattern that's been set up. So when my child came to me as a young child and lied about something, and of course the six-year-old brain, it was a younger child, thought I'm not gonna find out when I call the teacher, and of course I'm immediately found out. And my immediate reaction was, I failed you. Uh, if you're lying to me, I have failed you as a parent. And so I made a deal with this child that I will never react to whatever you do. And I would be grace, graced and gracious if you would please be honest with me. Now as a teenager, it's gonna take a little more mm -hmm. time because they have to trust, right. really trust that there will be no parental reaction and we can certainly talk more about it on an individual basis but we're failing our kids and they're doing the knee-jerk reaction of lying and then they get used to lying it's convenient it's safe it's a lot easier than the truth but we need to make the truth really valuable so that when they come and listen kids are drinking kids are doing all kinds of stuff and we have to be really neutral we don't go oh great we're so glad you got drunk tonight no Okay, so please understand that I'm not advocating depression all the time, but I am advocating being in the pain and not reacting to things. And as you start reacting or not reacting more and more and talking, you will see a change. So these patterns have to be deconstructed. deconstructed. It takes a little time, but with your kind of awareness and your openness, you can do it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good afternoon, Dr. Neva and uh, your panel. My name is Elizabeth Wellington, and I would like to get some advice on kids. 80% of the time they are being spent in school, which the professors and teachers more interact into these kids' lives. And I would like to know 
what advice can you give for kids who are being disturbed and the parents don't know, so their reaction at home is totally different compared in school where you all would see um, majority of the time their behavior. What advice could you give parents and you know other other people who really would like to know the answer to deal with situations like that? And also on that note, you focus on communication with kids. Communication is an effective role to play in a child's life, but some kids are very stubborn. So what other advice, other measures that could be taken there would help other people? Mm. So there are two questions yeah, you're asking, yes, yes, yes. and the wonderful loaded questions. I'll be happy to try to answer them as best I can, and I think Georgia might be able to help us as well. Um, let me start by saying that when a child exhibits a behavior that we deem negative, I don't believe there's really good and bad, mm -hmm. but something like stubbornness. First of all, it may be part of his true nature or her true nature. People are some, some more stubborn than others. But beneath behaviors that we don't like are usually unmet emotional needs. So the thing to find out is what is unmet in this child's need. And that comes with stepping back, with not reacting, with deep listening. And sadly, our schools are failing our children. There's no doubt, like you say, so much time is spent in school and it is a very unilateral paradigm that does not work for me. I don't want to say statistics or numbers, but for many of our kids, the schools are failing them in this very strict paradigm of sitting all day and tests and homework. So we have to work within that structure. Unless you're going to take your child out and you have the time and energy and wherewithal to homeschool your child, the thing to do is to make the, the home the safe haven. They have to close that door in the afternoon and know that they are safe here. They are safe from blame, from criticism, from any kind of emotional abuse, of course, from physical abuse, from discipline. Believe it or not, Elizabeth, I don't even believe in discipline. I think discipline hurts our kids. I instead believe in essential and effective boundaries, and they really are different because behaviors have natural consequences. When they fail the test or don't do the homework, they will feel it in school. They need not feel it at home. So the stubbornness is something that we would need to transform by finding out what's underneath it. And probably the unmet need is, I haven't been heard for a long time. You haven't listened to me. So they're, they're insisting. And that which we resist persists, right? right? So when we start to hear, you might see a little more flexibility. I and, hope that helps you. And also to add to that, like Please. looking at the habits and seeing what can be changed in the habits because of course every habit there's an end result and if you're trying to change something you first have to look at why why is he doing that why is she doing that what is the habit how do we get to the root of that and start to work on changing that so we can change the end result and also changing how we respond as parents even when we say you're this you're that and, and stop doing that because now we're, we're labeling them and they're, exactly. living up, they're living up to those labels. If you say, oh, you're being this way or you're being this way, and they're, they're going to react, they're going to act that out because you told them that they're that. So yeah. even changing the language that we're speaking to our children is going to help to change I, I love the that. habits. I love that. I really, you, you said they're stubborn. Just the word stubborn, like a client of mine insisted his child was lazy. I could you just stop using the word no? He's lazy. Well, guess what the child was? Lazy, lazy. Okay. <laughs> it's, kind of, it's kind of obvious. And so maybe stubborn is just a response to something right. going on. Right. Okay? Absolutely. Yeah, Thank absolutely. you for that. That was yeah. excellent. I want to focus on family, husband's wife. And there are some family have, you know, a dysfunctional situation due to the fact that the parent of the child would more focus on that child than rather focusing on the husband. How would you be able to, you know, the best advice mm -hmm. for husbands and wife to communicate better? Okay, so basically the focus is not, is on the child, not on 
the spouse. Yes, it's on the uh, child, and the, the spouse feel disconnected. Mm -hmm. Or neglected, yeah. Or neglected, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, well, I'll answer that to the best of my ability. But I think that, you know, if, if the other person's feeling neglected, they have to tell the, their spouse. We have to learn how to work through things together, even though we have to parent our child, we have to really discuss things and work it out before we can just put all the focus on them. Because, of course, if, he's, if, he, if she's feeling neglected or he's feeling neglected, that's going to affect the relationship and how you can be better parents as a team. So we don't want to ever have the other person feel neglected. So we have to talk to this person and say, you know what? I feel like you're just focused on the child when they do this and this and that. We need to work things out and then come to a conclusion as a team and say, okay, maybe we can start to do things differently so that we can start dealing with our child as a team opposed as one person feeling like you're giving all the attention to the child and I'm not. I just want to add to that. that that's excellent. Someone who's feeling neglected is living in a space of lack. Okay, because no one owes anybody anything. We don't owe our partners, and we don't even owe our children. In, in a certain way, we do owe our children a conscious attention, of course. But that person isn't feeling whole in and of himself or herself. So that person, you might say, you know, what is it about your experience that you're not feeling abundant in your life? You're feeling less than, and that's that person's issue. And, of course, it can become a couple's issue. Right. It, there's no doubt it can seep into that. And then I recommend also, and it's, it's sort of what Georgia said, is the child needs special time where the child can select the activity and have the parents, you know, absolute undistracted time, and then make time with the spouse. But, of course, everyone sort of needs to understand that these children need our attention. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you. My name is Valerie Anderson Campbell. My question is for you, um, Mrs. Kelly. I have two questions for you, uh, Ellen. Um, I wanted you to explain uh, truth, um, making truth valuable, um, and I wanted to, I know you said you are a lawyer, and I wanted to know how did you get into hmm. what you're currently doing, okay. and are you, and you're still practicing law, and okay. what kind of law is it? Oh, very interesting. Thank you for focusing on that. So for more, more than 30 years... I have been pra a full-time practicing attorney. Half of that was spent defend has been spent defending physicians and hospitals and medical malpractice cases. In the last 15 years, I have been an arbitrator, which means I'm like a judge. I make a de decisions on, on medical cases. So I've worked as a litigator, where it's a little more fighting in court. I work as an arbitrator now, where I make the decisions. And I also am trained as a mediator, where it's more collaborative. I feel that those skills have helped me to work with parents. Um, I try to make it less combative <laughs> and more collaborative, certainly, this work. Um, I got into parenting because I was a parent, and I felt that I was failing my children. When they were 8 and 10, I knew there was something I didn't know, Valerie, but I didn't know what I didn't know. But I decided I was going to learn it. I needed a new way. I was doing to them exactly what had been done to me. So my anxiety, my stress, I had anxious, stressed kids. It was so clear to me. But I didn't know that I needed to awaken and become enlightened and really become conscious so that I could take a pause in all of my reactions and shift the parenting. And slowly, slowly it shifted to these truly deep connections and, and stopping blame and stopping an imposition of anxiety because anxiety means we're fearing for the future. We're not present if we're anxious and we're fearful. We're coming from a place of less than and a place of lack. So I had to learn myself how to wake myself up in order to be the parent that I wanted to be. And you mentioned the other aspect of your question about truth. If you really want truth from your children, then allow it. But it's really scary to allow the truth. But the you, concept of making it valuable. It's, va it's very valuable. It's, it's, it's the greatest currency we have. And my children know, I, I, I'm, I'm sure they know that they can come to me and it's all okay. But you have to live this. You have to walk this walk, which means not to say that, like I said, it's okay if you're out drinking underage, but that you could tell me without consequences. And then 
then we try to come up with solutions. But the solutions come in the place of, in the space where there's non-judgment, where they know when they close that door that this is the safe haven. This is the place I can be honest. I can be myself. I can be less than, and you are not going to think less of me. So when parents say, I work so hard, and I want my kid to produce A's because he owes me that. No, no, no. That's conditional love. You work hard. You be your best self. You be that role model. Break glass ceilings. Be the best you can be. Get promotions. But don't do it because you demand of your child something like a, some kind of outcome, a certain college admission or a certain grade. No, you do it because you want to be your best self, and that's the role model you want to be. You be honest in your life, and then the child will know that they can be themselves and be honest in theirs, and they don't owe you. Okay, I hope that yeah. helps you, Valerie. Thank you. We have one more question. Okay, so um, uh, <laughs> my name is Emery Francois, and uh, I'm going to, I believe, try to unravel a question that's uh, more like a comment, perhaps. I appreciate the uh, discussion. Um, it, it's wonderful. I work as a school psychologist. Oh, that is so wonderful. I do see, uh, uh, you know, this um, constant battle in terms of what, you know, the, the home or the parents are trying to sometimes uh, 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 produce with, you know, in, in the child, and then the child, you know, goes to the uh, uh, school, and they get the other e end of it from, you know, you know, the buildings in terms of it's a, you know, double sword. So my, my question more is that, you know, in support of, you know, a parent who's trying to give the best support, you know, to their children, and then now let's say they are fading, and, uh, and, and, and the teachers now are the ones that uh, uh, perhaps is uh, depleting, uh, the, you know, the child's self-esteem. So how do we deal with that? And, and I would actually love to have you guys uh, perhaps, you know, have that kind of open communication with the teachers. Because mm -hmm. sometimes the teachers are also the parents. Yeah. And yet yes. they are, you know, kind of, you know, doing this parenting within the schools. Right. I think teachers need to be taught about conscious strategies. Don't you agree? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, you've hit on a huge issue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Consciousness in the classroom is critical, and a teacher who has 30 kids and who's tired and reactive and has outcomes mm -hmm. that are expected by the district sometimes is less than, you know, conscious as, as he or she needs to be. So, but I believe it all comes back then to the family, and if, at least if the parents can hear it and honor the child, and when the child complains about the school, allow the complaining and allow... You know, just it, it, the connection has to be between the parent and child as the ultimate bond. You know, it's hard to fix the whole school system. I wish we could. There's a lot to fix in the world right now. I think everyone would probably agree. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So it starts with ourselves. Right. And I consider the parent-child really the most sacred of the relationships. And certainly in most of our lives, we would say that. I think Jackie Onassis said, if you mess up your child, you've messed up everything. Um, we're also connected to our children. Of course, we ho we'd like to teach some of these paradigms to teachers. Yeah. Uh, well, I appreciate, you know, the discussion again. And, and as you, you guys pointed out, you know, the reaction. You know, I just want to mention to also emotional intelligence is something we don't teach. So right. the schools are life there to... Skills, right? They need to teach. Yeah, right. definitely. They need to teach life skills. They need to teach building self-confidence, speaking positive affirmations. Uh, teaching exactly. self-value, yes. you know, I, 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 I am worthy, I am smart, I am beautiful, like teaching affirmations. And, and I think once you go get to the root of that, personal development, yes. teaching them how to love self and to appreciate self and how to build self, then you can now deal with everything else mm -hmm. because they're in a place to see that I am worthy. I can do better in school. I can be successful exactly. in life. I do have opportunities around me. But if you're constantly teaching, you know, just work hard, work hard, work hard, and you're not teaching them how to build self, then how can they right. be better? 
that's a big way the schools are failing the children. I, 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 there's emotional intelligence, there's of course IQ, the intelligence quotient, the social quotient, and the emotional quotient, and we are failing on the emotional quotient. And to me, the emotional quotient mm -hmm. is probably the most important, important. and yep, the thing that is important. going to take Definitely. that child's trajectory. Yep. You can have a child go to the top school and fail, and you yeah. can have a child who gets a wonderful, maybe community college degree and soar right. because it's about what's inside. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. I agree. The schools, unfortunately, are so uh, um, overwhelmed in, in dealing with this common core kind of curriculum yes. that they but, are absolute, but absolutely. But still, teachers, that. in moment to moment, with their child, with their students, can learn sacred, essential little responses that can make all the difference. Big difference. Definitely. Yes. I know this is such a passionate conversation, <laughs> but we do have uh, to okay. wrap it up. Thank on. you so much for asking mm -hmm. that Thank question. You. Thank you, Dr. Neva. Yes. Um, Georgia, thank yes. you for this book. It is called Total BS, Body and Soul. Mm -hmm. And I want to say, again, you mentioned in order for you to help someone else, you have to be whole. It's like taking that flight and you have a child. You have to put on your seatbelt, make sure that you're okay, and then strap the child in. This is what family is about, that balance is about, and look at how we can move forward that we can have better parenting. Thank you so much, guys. And please tell the audience how they can find you. I'm going to start. Oh, mm -hmm. I have a website, enlightenedparenting.co. That's .co for coach, not .com. <laughs> I'd be, I have a website. I'd be delighted to hear from you, happy to share my card. And look forward to speaking with each and every one of you to help you in your parenting journey. And I hope it's an enlightened one. Thank you, Dr. Neva. You're yes. most welcome. Thank you so much, Dr. Neva. I think that so much of this information is so well needed all over in all the communities. Um, you can find my information on my website at www.georgiawoodbine.com. You can find me on every social media out there. I'm on Facebook, Walk the Talk with Georgia. Um, as I said before, I don't teach what I don't know, and I don't lead where I don't go. And like Dr. Neva said, it starts with self. So definitely go to the website if you get a chance. Yes, and I'm definitely going to read this <laughs> book. Again, I am Dr. Neva. You can find me at drneva.com. That's D-R-N-E-V-A dot com. Thank you and have a great day.